of Dr. Stephen Kane. I help people with peripheral neuropathy get out of pain and back to doing the things that they love doing. One of the ways that I help is by providing you with this free video educational series. And this particular video is a review on this book here, Numb Toes and Aching Souls, Coping with Peripheral Neuropathy, written by Dr. Jill Wolf. Dr. Wolf is the chair of the Department of Neurology at the University of Buffalo School of Medicine. Previously, he was a professor of neurology at Texas Southwestern School of Medicine, where he also was a director of the peripheral neuropathy clinics. Now, this book was written in 1999, so you might think, well, it's a good number of years ago. Is this information still valid? And unfortunately, yes, the medical treatments outlined in here are still pretty much the same ones offered today. And that's exactly what I think this book is great for, is understanding the various medical treatments available to people with peripheral neuropathy. I feel like it doesn't do the best job in terms of explaining the alternative therapies and how to best go about them. I'll tell you more in detail as we get into this review here. So I'm going to go chapter by chapter outlining some of the highlights that we have throughout the book here. All right, chapter one, what it is and how you get it. He does a wonderful job of taking something that's rather complex and making it simple, or at the very least, less complex. He talks about what peripheral neuropathy is, what causes it, how it's classified, and the different types of examinations and testing procedures used to determine if you do have peripheral neuropathy, and if so, to what degree. Chapter 2, Peripheral Neuropathy Pain. Again, he does a great job of explaining the two different aspects of pain, both the physical aspect of it and the psychological aspect of it. Chapter 3 is on medications. This is 65 pages educating the reader as to the different available medications for neuropathy and how they might infer which types of medications might work best for them. So at the very least, someone's going to have some good questions from reading this chapter that they can take to their primary doctor or their neurologist, whoever's managing their medications. Now the problem I have with this is that 65 pages dedicated to medications plus another 30 pages later on in Chapter 7, Experimental and Unapproved Drugs, this equates to 95 pages talking about medications and drugs to treat neuropathy, while only two pages talk about food and diet. Now this to me represents one of the biggest problems in the medical system that we are living in today. It is medications first and foremost and the food and diet are kind of an afterthought. And this is a massive problem because most people that have peripheral neuropathy in industrialized countries like the United States of America, they are not truly going to address the root cause of their neuropathies if they do not thoroughly address their diet. So if someone's only approaching from a medical, from this medication standpoint, then again, they're probably just going to be masking themselves from the pain and in the long run, this is highly toxic to their body. Again, this is the main qualm that I have with the book and with just the medical system as a whole and their approach to helping people with neuropathy. Screen information is just not painting the right picture and how a person needs to think about getting themselves better from their neuropathy. Chapter 4 is Other Medical Treatments. Again, wonderful information for people with peripheral neuropathy to be aware of. But again, it should be taken in the light of if you cannot get the results you're looking for with natural measures. Now, the two different types of these other medical treatments discussed are hematological or blood-based treatments as well as nerve-based treatments. Now these hematological treatments are primarily geared for people that have autoimmune conditions such as CIDP or chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy or Guillain-Barre syndrome. The two different types of these hematological treatments are plasmapheresis and IVIG. Plasmapheresis is where they take the plasma out of your blood and the plasma is what contains the antibodies and they re-enter the cells back into your body without the plasma, meaning you don't have these antibodies, which is what is believed to be causing the neuropathy in the first place. So again, a lot of people with these autoimmune-mediated conditions can get good benefit from this plasmapheresis. Secondly, there is IVIG, or intravenous immunoglobulin therapy. This is where they take a donor's blood, put it into a patient's body, 
and it's believed that the antibodies from the donor blood will help to prevent or at the very least slow the person's own antibodies from attacking their own nerves. All right, next up are the nerve-based treatments consisting of nerve blocks as well as direct nerve stimulation. The nerve blocks can be either a local anesthetic, something injected into the nerve to block pain signals from getting to the brain, or some type of neurolytic agent, something that literally destroys the nerves, whether it's some sort of injection or a surgery. Now these neurolytic agents, these things that permanently destroy the nerve, these should very much be a last case resort because if it doesn't go well, then a person could be stuck in an even worse situation permanently. Now for the direct nerve stimulation, this is essentially using a TENS unit, which stands for Transcutaneous Electrical Neuromuscular Stimulation. What this does is essentially send competing signals up to the brain. So this TENS unit causes the muscles to contract and release real quick, creates a tingling sort of sensation, and your brain focuses more on that and less on the pain. It tends to be more of a temporary reduction in pain, however, it's safe, very few side effects, if any at all, and I highly recommend you at least try one of these if you haven't already and you're having a tough time managing the pain with your neuropathy. All right, chapter 5 is alternative treatments. Dr. Wolf discussed physical therapy, psychotherapy, hyperbaric oxygen, acupuncture, manual therapy such as massage, magnetic therapy as well as chelation therapy. Now, Dr. Wolf presents all of these therapies as something at least worth considering doing except for chelation therapy because this is a highly controversial form of therapy. Now, we did miss out on quite a few other forms of therapy that are alternative and yet still can very much be helpful and are very safe for the user to try. Some of these are chiropractic, vibration therapy, pulse electromagnetic fields, brush therapy, barefoot walking on grass, infrared therapy, and ointments. I was especially surprised I didn't mention anything about ointments because these are very commonplace, lots of people use them. I still have yet to hear about one person who's tried frankincense and myrrh and not had at least a temporary suppression in their discomfort. So I definitely think this is something that he missed out on and so that I want to make sure you're aware of. Chapter 6 is nutrients. This is essentially supplements or different nutrient injections that a person could get to help them with their neuropathy. Now, he spends about 53 pages discussing all of these different approaches to these nutrients that a person can get in the form of a pill or an injection, and again, only two pages talking about diet. Again, this is not painting the right picture. Most people with neuropathy are gonna get far greater results by eating a healthy diet than they will by taking any form of supplementation. With that said, it's still great information, does a great job explaining the mechanism and how these different types of supplements or injections can help a person get better, does a very fair job in explaining the research behind it, but again, these supplements, these small pills that you take tend to have a much smaller effect than the vastness of the entirety of the food that you ingest into your system. Chapter 7, Experimental or Unapproved Drugs. Now, more than 20 years later, after this book was written, these therapies are still experimental or unapproved. Some of them have become mainstream despite not having the whole amount of research they would need to be considered approved. Things like cannabinoids or CBD oil have definitely reached a lot of people and from my experience have ended up helping quite a few people with their neuropathy. So you might find some ideas and things you want to try in this chapter, but again, they are still considered experimental or unapproved treatments for neuropathy. Chapter 8 is Diabetes and HIV Special Considerations. For diabetes, they talk about the difference between type 1 and type 2, where type 1 is more something that you're born with, and type 2 is something that's more lifestyle-driven and more of a later onset. Talk about the prevalence of these different types of diabetes, and they also talk about the importance of managing your blood sugar, which is a very important thing to discuss because that's at the core of how someone can potentially reverse their diabetic neuropathy. Now, the author does not do a great job of discussing a holistic approach to best managing someone's blood sugar. They real briefly mention diet and they talk about medications. 
and exercise as means to help managing blood sugar. However, they don't talk about how much exercise a person should do. They don't talk about all the different nuances of diet and how that can play in to best managing blood sugar. And they don't talk at all about stress management or getting good sleep, which also influence your blood sugar levels. So I feel like this aspect definitely did not paint the whole picture, which is a very important thing because diabetes is the most common cause of peripheral neuropathy in the United States of America and most other industrialized countries. Now for HIV, they talk about how the medications for HIV can in and of themselves cause a neuropathy and how they can also lead to a depletion of other nutrients such as magnesium or vitamin B12 which can then in turn lead to having a neuropathy. So it's a very important chapter to read if you are someone with an HIV mediated neuropathy. Chapter 9 is coping, and here the author does a pretty decent job discussing exercise, both how it's so important and different approaches a person can take to implementing exercise into their life, such as trying out swimming if walking or other things that put pressure on the feet tend to be too uncomfortable. He also talks about the importance of sleep and gives some recommendations on how a person can get better sleep, such as cutting out nicotine, alcohol, or caffeine before going to bed. Also talks about the use of cold and or warm to help manage the pain. So using cold packs or hot packs or other means of altering the temperature around the part of your body experiencing the neuropathy. Now finally, the author gets to diet. Only spends a couple pages on it and doesn't really seem to have his own personal philosophy or attitude towards what to eat or what not to eat. Rather, he cites some other doctors and what their recommendations are in terms of the foods to eat or not to eat. These recommendations on foods not to eat are milk, chocolate, MSG, aspartame, red meat, and sugar. In terms of the foods to eat, they recommend three servings of fruits and or vegetables a day, and eating foods high in inositol, such as cantaloupe or grapefruit. Again, it's good that he's discussing diet as it pertains to neuropathy, just not nearly to the depth that is warranted by how important diet is to helping people with their neuropathy. He further goes on to discuss other aspects of managing neuropathy through the socks and the shoes that you wear. It does a great job of walking through all the different options that are out there. And he also discusses ways to best manage your environment. So things like putting a seat in your shower and putting a, a rail so you can hang on. Things are going to help prevent someone with poor sensation in their feet from falling while they're in their shower, amongst many other recommendations that I definitely encourage you to read through to make sure you're as safe and working as smart as you can considering the neuropathy that you have. The last chapter is Final Notes, in which he encourages both caregivers and care receivers to be empathetic of the other side. He also encourages people to consider donating to the Neuropathy Association. Both great points for people to think of. Overall, I feel this book is a great resource for people considering different medical options to help them manage their neuropathy pains. However, this book does not do justice to the lifestyle approaches that people can and should be taking to truly help themselves get better, which is why I'm here to help bring this message to you because the medical system is not doing a great job of emphasizing how important these lifestyle approaches are to help people get better from their neuropathy. Thank you for watching the video. Any comments, please leave it down below. Otherwise, I will see you in the next one. Take care.